हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर डी वी प्रसाद फ्रॉम इंदिरा गांधी नेशनल ट्राइबल यूनिवर्सिटी अमरकंटक टुडे वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट द मॉड्यूल चेंजेस इन सिंपल एकानमी फ्रॉम पेपर सोशल कल्चरल एंथ्रोपोलॉजी लेट अस सी व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी इन दिस मॉड्यूल यू शैल बी एबल टू लर्न the definitions and the characteristics of primitive economy you would also be able to know the stages of economy and to identify the different types of hunting and gathering that is hunting by weapons traps snares engaging tamed animals poisoning etc you should be able to identify the different types of fishing like fishing by nets poisoning weapons and engaging tamed animals etc let us talk about economic anthropology economic anthropology envisages economic activities of primitive man in his social and cultural framework in other words we can say that economic anthropology is an analysis of economic life as a subsystem of societies for 1951 is of opinion that economic anthropology deals with social relations economy is an important constituent of the community life and plays a deciding role in the formation of cultural and social structure of the society as a matter of fact the economic life of the tribal people helps us to understand an important feature of their culture economic anthropology is the major subfield of social anthropology which deals with the way groups of people play in the tribal societies and obtain a living from nature and with the factors affecting the organization of those engaged in such activities it also deals with distribution of goods and services in societies and attempts to explain who gets what and why economic anthropology is different from general economics because it deals with primitive and peasant societies in which the economy is organized significantly with different than what it is in industrial society thus economic anthropologists have to reexamine the fundamental notions which economists taken for granted however among the primitive economy the important subjects of study are the concepts of labor production and consumption the barter and ceremonial exchange and value in non monetary economic system which are the source of major theoretical argument arguments over which scholars life herskovits raymond fort salisbury polyani malnowski etc have done significant works another difference between economic anthropology and classical economics is that while the latter is normally concerned with the problems of distribution because these dominates in industrialized economics anthropologists studying primitive and peasant societies are forced to pay more attention to small scale production economic anthropology not only deals with the inner dynamics of primitive and peasant societies but also explores the involvement of these societies in national and world economics often it attempts to explain the success of failure of primitive societies in the wider economy studies of this type by anthropologists 
are often linked with evaluating or even guiding community development projects. Very recently, however, the emphasis has turned from stressing the modernizing effect of contact with wider economics to concern with the impoverishment which seems to follow the involvement of marginal societies with the wider economy. Finally, it may be concluded that meaning and scope of primitive economy may be traced deeply in the material wants of the people. The activities associated with fulfillment of material wants as Herskovitz suggests constitute as important part of the economic life of the tribal societies. In a tribal society where the price system is normally absent and social tradition regulates the economic activities. The general economic theories meant for the complex societies would hardly be applicable in the primitive societies. Definitions of primitive economy On the basis of meaning and scope of primitive economy, especially in the field of social anthropology, scholars have defined precisely the primitive economy and some of these definitions are given below for the benefit of the students. Ralph Biddington 1952 says, Economic system is designed to satisfy material wants of the people, to organize production, to control distribution and to determine the rights and claims of ownership within the community. Raymond for same year 1952 is of the opinion that economic organization is a type of social action. It involves the combination of various kinds of human services with one another and with goods in such a way that they serve the given ends. Majundar and Madan 1956 believe that it consists of the ordering of an organization of human relation and human efforts in order to procure as many of the necessities of day-to-day -day life as possible. With the expenditure of minimum efforts, it is attempted to secure the maximum satisfaction possible through adopting limited means to unlimited ends in an organized manner. Jad Dalton 1971 argues that all societies have structured arrangements to provide the material means of individual and community life. It is these structured rules that we call an economic system. Characteristics of the primitive economy There are many characteristics of the primitive economic system which have been enumerated by some of the scholars which are given below for the benefit of the students. According to Dalton, there are three important characteristics of primitive economy. They are mainly small economy, simple technology, geographical or cultural isolation. Small economy. It is this smallness of scale which is fundamental characteristic of primitive life. The most resources, goods and services, transactions take place within a community of persons numbered in hundreds or thousands. There are two other factors which make tribal economic small in scale. Frequently one or two staple items comprise usually large proportion of total produce. It is common for these important staples to be produced within the small framework of tribe. A relatively small number of goods and services is produced and acquired. Simple technology compared to the industrialized economics. The tools are either made by the user himself or acquired 
free from a craftsman or from a manufacturing group geographical or cultural isolation majundar and madan have found nine important traits of a primitive economy as noticed in the tribal india and elsewhere hunting and gathering hunting and food gathering is the oldest source of subsistence societies that depend on hunting and gathering for their basic subsistence were fairly common as late as the early 20th century australia was represented by little else the western half of north america was a little earlier than that the preserve of people who grind their livings by hunting and gathering the north west coast depend on fishing and berries the california indians on acorns fishing in the remote past of prehistoric days men carried on his search for food and land by hunting gradually as hunting was very difficult for them owing to various reasons man took up his search on aquatic creatures like a fish this was first evidenced during upper paleolithic period when people extensively used harpoon heads with barbs magdalian times in kitchen midden cultures of mesolithic period man also used to consume aquatic creatures like molas extensively fishing was first started by bare hands a number of tribals practice it even today especially in paddy fields during rainy season but as fishes slip away from hand a man devised various fishing methods to catch fish more easily this fishing methods can be broadly divided into five major divisions fishing by weapons fishing by traps fishing by nets fishing by poisoning fishing by engaging tamed animals the indians of the great basin country of nevada and idaho on grass seeds and game plain indian culture depended almost solely on the buffalo as the basis of subsistence in africa the hunters and gatherers range from the pygmies of the ituri forest to the bushmen of the kalahari desert most south american indians depended on hunting though in many areas also grow manioc whatever might be the evolutionary development of hunting techniques we can classify the hunting methods of recent primitives under the following four categories first of all hunting by weapons by using techniques of assault and hunting by traps and snares it will use the techniques of trapping and snaring and hunting by traps and snares they will have different types of traps to hunt the animals in the forest when hunting by engaging tamed animals for example techniques of enlisting animal aid in some societies the dogs will be trained how to catch the game in the forest and some societies there may be some other kind of animals then comes to hunting by poisoning and there are different types of techniques of poisoning in tribal societies for example that they use some of the herbs ya nuts and they mash it and they will mix in the water so that fish will be come outside and they can easily catch cultivation in cohen's typology the three adaptive strategies based in food production in non industrial societies are hot culture agriculture and pastoralism in non western cultures 
as is also true in modern nations, people carry out a variety of economic activities. Each adaptive strategy refers to the main economic activity. Pastoralism, for example, consume milk, butter and meat from the animals as their mainstay of their diet. However, they also add grain to the diet by doing some cultivating or by trading with neighbors. Food producers also may hunt or gather to supplement a diet based on domesticated species. Throughout the world, there are to be found peoples whose basic technique for exploiting the environment is to keep animals. These animals may be reindeer among the laps or northern Siberians. They may be goats in Morocco and along the northern edges of the Sahara, they may be the cattle of the near east or of much of Africa. They may be the camels that are found in Arabia and the Sahara. They may be horses as was the case in the Great Plains area of North America. They may be pigs in Melanesia and in South America. There are heads of Ilama. Foraging. Until 10,000 years ago, people everywhere were foragers, also known as hunter-gatherers. However, environmental differences did create substantial contrast among the world's foragers. Some such as the people who lived in Europe during the ice ages were big game hunters. Today, hunters in Arctic still focus on large animals and herd animals. They have much less vegetation and variety in their diets than do tropical foragers. In general, as one moves from colder to warmer areas, there is an increase in the number of species. The tropics contain tremendous biodiversity, a great variety of plant and animal species, many of which have been used by human foragers. Agriculture Agriculture is cultivation that requires more labor than horticulture. Thus, because it uses land intensively and continuously. The greater labor demands associated with agriculture reflect its common use of domesticated animals, irrigation or terracing. Implements for loosening the soil. We find a series of operations like ploughing or tilling the soil, leveling, manuring, preparation of seed, transplanting, weeding, harvesting are involved in the cultivation of crops of which first one is of utmost importance. The tilling the soil to loosen the earth is done by different people in different ways. The Naga and the Chakma use it during their cultivation by a hoi or dao. The Mal Paharia by simple digging stick, the Karia and the African Bushman by composite digging stick, and so on. Horticulture Horticulture and agriculture are two types of cultivation found in non industrial societies. Both differ from the farming systems of industrial nations like United States and Canada which use large land areas, machinery and petrochemicals. According to Cohen, horticulture is cultivation that makes intensive use of none of the factors of production that is land, labor, capital and machinery. Horticulturists use simple tools such as hoists and digging sticks to grow their crops. Their fields are not permanently cultivated and life follow for varying lengths of time. 
horticulture often involves slash and burn techniques. Here, horticulture is clear land by cutting down and burning forests or bush by setting fire to the grass covering a plot. The vegetation is broken down, pests are killed and the ashes remain to fertilize the soil. The crops are then sown, tended and harvested. Use of the plot is not continuous. Often it is cultivated for only a year. This depends however on soil fertility and weeds which compete with cultivated plants for nutrients. On the onset of monsoon, they sprinkle the seeds of different crops like gondli, maruva, kutti and other millets as well as pulses. Oil seeds, tobacco and maize seeds are also sown by broadcasting method. With the advent of winter, they harvest their crops. No artificial irrigation, no man manuring is done for the sort of cultivation. The ashes of burnt bushes serve as auto manure to the soil. After doing this sort of cultivation in a particular track for two or three consecutive years, the shifting hill cultivators have to shift to some such places in the vicinity to operate the same type of cultivation. It is estimated that about 11% of the total tribal population in India practice such type of cultivation by slash and burn method. Shifting hill cultivation. This sort of primitive cultivation is known by different names in different places. The Juang of Orissa and also the Andhra Pradesh tribals call it Podu. In Assam and Tripura, the tribals call it Jhum. In Madhya Pradesh, it is known as Bevar, Dahiya or Penda. In North Odisha, it is known as Rama, Dahi or Bringa. The Garo, Khasi, Defle, Naga, Abor, Mismi, Riyang and the board of northeastern region practice such type of cultivation. It is known to the Gon of Bastar, the Korva of Bihar claim it to be their traditional cultivation. The Reddis of South India still practice such type of primitive cultivation. Digging stick, hoy, pick and spade are the implements for loosening the soil used by the primitive man. A change took place with the introduction of plough which makes continuous furrowing. There is no record of its origin except a few engraved pictures in the prehistoric walls of Egypt and Babylonia. For this reason, we do not have still any true concept about the evolution of plough. By shifting cultivation, we mean a type of primitive cultivation which is generally done in hilly forested tract for two to three consecutive years and is then left abandoned as the soil may lose fertility. This cultivation is also known as slash and burn method of agriculture. For the Indian tribals, it seems to be an age old practice. A particular tract is selected for his purpose. Trees and ungrowths are felled, sparing some tall trees. This clearing business starts in the month of January and felled trees and bushes are left for several days to be dried in the sun and the tribals set fire to these dried wooden branches. Then they try to till the soil with a 
digging stick are hoi but not as rigorously as done by the plow cultivators on the plains an irrigated field is a capital investment that usually increases in value it takes time for a field to start yielding it reaches full productivity only after several years of cultivation the if you go like other irrigators have farmed the same fields for generations in some agricultural areas including the middle east however salts carried in the irrigation water can make fields unusable after 50 or 60 years terracing terracing is another agricultural technique the ifigo have mastered their homeland has small valleys separated by steep hillsides because the population is dense people need to farm the hills however if the simply planted on the steep hillsides fertile soil and crops would be washed away during the rainy season to prevent this if you go cut into the hillside and build stage after stage of terraced fields rising above the valley floor springs located above the terrace supply their irrigation water the labor necessary to build and maintain a system of terraces is great terrace walls crumble each year and must be partially rebuilt the canals that bring water down through the terraces also demand attention domesticated animals many agriculturists use animals as means of production for transport as cultivating machines and for their manure asian farmers typically incorporate cattle or water buffaloes into agricultural economies based on rice production rice farmers may use cattle to trample pre tilled flooded fields thus mixing soil and water prior to transplanting many agriculturists attach animals to plow and harrows for field preparation before planting or transplanting also agriculturists typically collect manure from their animals using it to fertilize their plots thus increasing yields animals are attached to carts for transport as well as to implements of cultivation irrigation while horticulturists must wait the rainy season agriculturists can schedule their planting in advance because they control water like other irrigation experts in the philippines the ifigo irrigate their fields with canals from rivers streams springs and ponds irrigation makes it possible to cultivate a plot year after year irrigation enriches the soil because the irrigated fields is a unique ecosystem with several species of plants and animals many of them minute organisms whose waste fertilize the land yahudi adaptive strategies their economic typology are summarized in the table you can see the table having three columns first one is adaptive strategy that is foraging horticulture agriculture pastoralism and industrialism and they are also known as hunting gathering slash and burn shifting cultivation swedening dry farming intensive farming herding industrial production the key features are varieties are associated with this mobility use of nature's resource for a horticulture fallow period agriculture continuous use of land intensive use of labor for pastoralism nomadism and transhumans for industrialism factory production capitalism 
and socialist production. Changes in economy, intensive agriculture in non-industrial cities. With the intensification of agriculture, some farming villages grow into towns and even cities. In these larger population centers, individuals who had previously been engaged in farming were free to specialize in other activities. Thus, craft specialists such as carpenters, blacksmiths, sculptors, basket makers and stone cutters contribute to the vibrant, diversified life of the city. Unlike horticulturists and pastoralists, city dwellers are only indirectly concerned with adapting to their natural environment. Far more important is the need to adapt to living and getting along with their fellow urbanites. Pastoralism Pastoralists live in North Africa, Middle East, Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. These headers are people whose activities focus on such domesticated animals as cattle, sheep, goats, camels and yak. East African pastoralists like many others live in symbiosis with their herds. Herders attempt to protect their animals and to ensure their reproduction in return for food and other products such as leather. Herds provide dairy products, meat and food. Animals are killed at ceremonies which occur throughout the year and so beef is available regularly. People use livestock in variety of ways. Natives of North America, Great Plains, for example, did not eat their horses. For Plains Indians, horses served as tools of the trade, means of production, used to hunt buffalo, a main target of their economies. So the Plains Indians were not true pastoralists, but hunters who used horses as many agriculturalists use animals as means of production. The Aztec state The Aztec state which developed in Mexican highlands in the 15th century is a good example of a highly developed urban society among Americans, indigenous people and where an urban political elite also gained control over food production in the surrounding countryside. Its capital city, Tenochtitlan, was located in a fertile valley 7000 feet above sea level. Its population along with that of its sister city, Plato Loco, reached about 2 lakh in the early 16th century. This make it five times more populous than the city of London at the same time. The Aztec social order was stratified into three main classes, nobles, commoners and serfs. The serfs were bound to the land and the lowest of this class were the slaves. Some had sold themselves into bondage, others were captives taken in war. The state was governed by an absolute monarch assisted by a large number of government officials who oversaw various functions such as maintenance of the tax system and courts of justice, management of government storehouses and control of military training. Urbanization brings with it a new social order, marked inequality develops as society becomes more complex and people are ranked according to how much control they hold over resources, the kind of work they do, their gender or the family they are born into. As social institutions cease to operate in simple face-to-face -face groups of relatives, friends and acquaintances, they become more formal and bureaucratic with specialized political institutions. With urbanization came a sharp increase 
in the tempo of human cultural change writing was invented trade intensified and expanded the wheel and the sail were invented metallurgy and other crafts were also developed in early cities monumental buildings such as royal palaces and temples were built by thousands of men often slaves taken in war these feats of engineering still amaze modern architects and engineers the inhabitants of these buildings the ruling class composed of nobles and priests formed a central government that dictated the social and religious rules to be followed and carried out by the merchants craft specialists warriors servants and other city dwellers throughout the 1800s and 1900s this resulted in large scale industrialization of many societies technological inventions utilizing oil electricity and nuclear energy brought out more dramatic changes in social and economic organization on a worldwide scale in the late 20th century the electronic digital revolution made the production and distribution of information the center of economic activity in some wealthy societies so students let us summarize what we have learned in this module economic anthropology is the major subfield of social anthropology which deals with the way group of people play in tribal societies and obtain a living from nature and with the factors affecting the organization of those engaged in such activities it also deals with the distribution of goods and services in societies and attempts to explain who gets what and why however among the primitive economy the important subjects of study are the concept of labor production and consumption barter and the ceremonial exchange value in non monetary economic systems etc which are the source of major theoretical arguments over which scholars like Herskovitz, Raymond Forth, Salisbury, Polyani, and Malinowski, etc., have done significant works. On the basis of these meanings and scope of primitive economy, especially in the field of social anthropology, scholars have defined precisely the primitive economy, and some of these definitions are given by Ralph Fiddington. Raymond Firth, Madanan Majundar, George Dalton, and for the benefit of the students. In brief, it can be said that the concept and meaning of economic system with special reference to the tribals may be defined that economic system may have two important things that is the mode and structure of production and its relations and the process of distribution exists and operating in a given social political setup the mode of production implies techniques and organization of economic activities relating to production some anthropologists believe that man has process in early days through four main stages of livelihood that is hunting and gathering fishing pastoralism and agriculture until about 200 years ago human societies all across the world had developed a cultural infrastructure based on foraging horticulture agriculture pastoralism crafts trade or some combination of these this changed with the invention of the steam engine in england which brought about an industrial revolution that quickly spread to other parts of the globe machines and tools powered by water wind and steam 
followed by oil, gas and the diesel fuel, replaced human labor and human tools, increasing factory production and facilitating mass transportation. Throughout the 1890s, this resulted in large scale industrialization of many societies. Technological inventions utilizing oil, electricity and nuclear energy brought about more dramatic changes in social and economic organization on a world scale since the 1940s. In the late 20th century, the electronic digital revolution made the production and distribution of information the center of economic activity in some wealthy societies. Thank you.